has a population that's now close to 2,000 people or maybe slightly over. When I started the program, there were maybe 14 or 1,500 people here. We established the school um, in 1997 after a consultation visit in 1996. And I had been coming to the community, my first trip was 1985. And it was partly the, the cultural strength of the community, its size and uh, the resources available. So I wanted uh, a program that would have people look closely at the communities. The possibility of community in the contemporary world really is the question for me that the program poses. It doesn't hurt that this is a part of a glacial mountain fjord complex, so it's particularly beautiful. But it's not, I don't bring students here that they go wow or that they have the land-based trip. They, we go out on the land, we come back, they see Pangerton with different eyes and they see you know, both the horrors that are here to a certain extent. There are people living quite miserable lives and they see the joy and the possibility of the good life in Nusa Tiavik that's here. Um, and, uh, and I think see how these communities are divided down the middle as colonial constructs and as constructs that come out of uh, Inuit culture. On an everyday level there are all kinds of uh, practices where um, you know Inuit culture kind of deeply inflects uh, almost everything that people are doing in the community. You know hunting as a way of life involves you know hunting for uh, for whales, for killaluga, for uh, tugali, for akvik, beluga, um, narwhal and bowhead whales. Hunting polar bears they have a quota. Hunting caribou, uh, hunting Hunting seals especially, Natsik is daily bread for people in Pangertung, so uh, seal hunting is very uh, much practiced. And then women, although sometimes men as well, engage in a lot of work with uh, fur production. So there are seal skins turned into either clothing or other objects that people are trying to sell. So there's a lot of uh, craft production with using traditional materials. So it's important to understand that all of the Inuit culture that is in the pores of this community are taking place also through modern technology and in a contemporary context. And then that I think spills over in many ways into what we might call a high art or formal artistic practice. So there's a printmaking studio in Pangerton. There's a tapestry studio where women are using a different kind of technology but still working with you know, fabric and material to produce some quite striking images. And we have sculptors in the background here. You hear some you know, carvers going away at soapstone. Soapstone carvings are quite prominent in the community. I've noticed throat chanting has come back into Pangerton, so there are young women who are quite freely engaged in, uh, in the traditional practice of throat chanting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, both material cultural practice and um, intangible culture are absolutely continue to be vital in Pang, although there are some significant changes. Modern hunters aren't using kayaks and harpoons so much, although harpoons are still used in the whale hunt. They're using high-powered rifles, motorized boats, snowmobiles. They're using carving tools. You know, in the old days, an Inuit carving was a very small thing that had a spiritual power that you could carry around with you. No self-respecting traditional Inuit would have a coffee table carving because what the hell would they do with it if they were semi-nomadic? Uh, so carving is done for the market. It's a traditional activity and uses traditional forms, but it takes place in an absolutely contemporary context. And so I think there are just so many different fascinating things students from any kind of background, whether it's a humanities approach to literature and storytelling, or environmental studies approach, or philosophy or history, or my discipline, Native Studies, you name it, Pengertung has something to say to you. My hope is that the students who've come on will all say it's one of the best educational experience they've ever been through. I articulate it as an embodied learning experience. I give the students a lot of freedom to find their own way and make their own mistakes, as I did when I came up to the Arctic. Well, we give them some guidance and we do some lectures. Um, but I think in the end it, uh, it exposes students to a whole different value system that might make them, it's like reflexive anthropology. Realize that your own values you've naturalized and you can come to see that you know, your own um, values are something that you can choose. And so you might choose to have different values or you might at least accept your own values knowing that uh, there are other possibilities out there.